Hello and welcome to another episode of Childhood Rewind, and in this episode we are switching gears. Last time I watched a movie I loved as a child, which I didn't think would be good, and this time I will be watching a film I hated, which I actually think might be pretty great. You see, as a child, I really loved reading books. Like, I would get in trouble in school for reading under my desk. And I really loved seeing adaptations of books I read. My big problem was that if too much was changed from book to screen, I immediately hated the adaptation, no matter how good the rest of it was. So you can imagine when I sat down as a child to watch an adaptation of one of my favorite fantasy series and didn't see a word-for-word -word adaptation, I was royally pissed off and then spent years thinking of it as blasphemous. Where's the box? The Spiderwick Chronicles. Did I hit somebody? Yes, thank you. Yes, as a child, I absolutely hated the 2008 film adaptation of the Spiderwick Chronicles. And the only reason I remember hating it was because of all the changes made from the books. And like I said, I absolutely loved the books. My parents got me and my siblings the audiobook for Christmas one year, and both me and my older brother fell in love. By the way, when I did go back to listen to them again in preparation for this, I had the incredible realization that they were narrated by Mark freaking Hamill. Yes, the man behind The Joker, Fire Lord Ozai, The Trickster, and Luke Skywalker was a huge part of my childhood without me ever knowing it. And after listening to all of them again, which I highly recommend the entire series it only takes five hours to listen to he did an incredible job and made me respect him even more as a voice actor i know that he isn't just a celebrity who went into voice acting for an easy paycheck he actually was in the voice acting business before becoming a big star but seriously he is just awesome but with that well-deserved mark hamill praise out of the way and the books now once again fresh in my mind i think it's about time we dive into watching this picture with another unhindry gap <laughs> The film opens with this guy who we soon learn is Arthur Spiderwick and he is writing this book on fairies but something obviously isn't too happy about that and makes it clear he is in danger. Eight years later this family moves into the very same house the guy was writing the book in. This is Helen Grace who was recently divorced and she is taking care of her daughter Mallory and her twin boys Simon and Jared. And they're staying here because it's owned by her family and is the only place they can afford to stay in because it's free. We get some typical sibling fights and character development with Mallory as the always in charge older sister, Simon as the quiet intellectual, and Jared as the rebellious loner as well as the one who thinks that his dad is coming back. While unpacking Jared hears something in the walls and Mallory breaks open the wall to discover a large nest which seems to be too well designed for an animal to have made. While cleaning up the mess, Jared figures out that the nest is also a dumbwaiter which goes up to a secret room in the house attic. The very same room seen in the opening and apparently this thing in the walls is intelligent enough to write and wants them to get the hell out of there. But before he leaves, Jared finds the book that the guy in the opening was writing and spends all night reading about fairies before being interrupted the next morning by Mallory who has been tied to the bed by her hair. With the book's help, Jared figures out that the thing that tied Mallory's hair was a house brownie which turned into a boggart after Mallory destroyed its nest. Jared makes a new nest and soon meets Thimbletack who explains the author of the book created a protective circle around the house to keep the book safe from a shape-shifting ogre named Mulgrath. A protected circle which Simon just happens to be stepping out of that very moment. This allows a group of invisible goblins to grab him and drag him away. After taking a stone which lets him see the invisible creatures, Jared goes after Simon and discovers him locked up in a goblin camp which is also where he finds the Seth Rogen comedic relief. This is Hogsquill, a hobgoblin who wants revenge on Mulgraff and gives Jared fairy vision by spinning in his face. Unfortunately, birds and acts are too tempting and Jared is left to rescue Simon on his own, but he's too late as the goblins summon Mulgraff who appears as an old man and makes Simon swear to bring him the field guide. Simon and Jared race back to the house and make it inside the circle. Mallory is stuck outside but with a little help from the seeing stone and good old-fashioned stabbing, she makes it inside too. On Thimbletack's advice, they try to destroy the guy, but it's magically protected, so they decide to visit their great aunt Lucinda for some answers. Jared and Mallory sneak out through a tunnel, but are discovered and chased by Mulgrath in troll form. Luckily, the modern world comes to their aid, and the siblings make it to Lucinda, who warns them that her father, Arthur Spiderwick, was the one who wrote the book, and they must find him so that he can destroy it because it only puts everyone in danger. Unfortunately, Jared decided to bring the book with him, and half the pages are ripped out by a group of goblins. And wouldn't you know what one of those ripped pages happens to contain the protective circle reversal spell? Helen finds the siblings and brings them home, but Jared is angry about the divorce and runs off after saying he hates her. After she leaves, Hogswheel shows up and tells the siblings, after providing Mallory and Simon with fairy vision, that Mulgrath is going to break the protective circle that night, and that they need to keep the book safe because it contains secrets about every other fairy species which Mulgrath will use to take over the fairy world. Looking for support, Jared tries to call his dad, but Mallory reveals he found someone else and has moved on. But no time for that, the goblins have arrived and they don't have much time to figure out a way to stop Mulgrath. But wait, what about the guy who literally wrote the book on fairy weaknesses? Yes, by calling on the always helpful Griffin, the siblings are taken to a hidden fairy 
fairy world where Arthur Spiderwick has been ever since he was taken by the Sylph fairies for not destroying the book when they told him to. He hasn't realized any time has gone by and he does not want to destroy the field guide because it represents his life's work, but Jared reminds him he's over a hundred and his life is long past over. Arthur almost relents, but turns out he couldn't destroy the book if he wanted to because Thimbletack switched the covers before they left the house. Arthur tells Jared all he needs to defeat Mulgrath is the power of knowledge and off they go back for the climax. Goblins have surrounded the house by the time they get back and hey, Helen's driving straight into a murder frenzy. Luckily, the kids get her inside the circle and with the seeing stone, convince her of the existence of fairies and they need to get ready for a fight. With Thimbletack's help and knowledge from the book, they create a tomato sauce mixture in order to kill the goblins and prepare for midnight. And once the seal is broken, it's chaos time as goblins attack and Mulgrath emerges from the floor. Luckily, tomato sauce for goblins is the same as water and witches and using the stove as a catalyst, the family explodes the mixture all over the house, melting every goblin in sight. But wait, somehow their dad overcame his whole moving on thing and comes back to tell Jared he loves him, but Jared's not having any of that and luckily his suspicion was right because yeah, it was Mulgrath who chases Jared and the book onto the roof. Jared falls and he can't hold on much longer, but he throws the book off the roof, forcing Mulgrath to chase after it as a bird. And wait, wasn't there someone who just loved chasing after birds? Hello, Hogsqueal, to the rescue, and the battle is won. The family is now closer than ever, even without their father, and Lucinda moves back in with them, but not for long because the Sylph bring back Arthur for a visit, but he can't stay long without turning to dust, so Lucinda decides to go with them, which apparently makes her a kid again, and they presumably live happily ever after together in the fairy world, while the Grace family has a whole lot of therapy to go through. Okay, so like I said at the beginning, I hated this thing as a child because of how much it strayed from the books. But now as a legal adult with a somewhat functioning brain, I understand that adaptations need to change to fit the medium. So with that in mind, is this better than I remember? Well, not only is it better, I actually think it's the best case scenario for a Spiderwick film we could have gotten. Now when I say that, I don't mean it brought everything from the book accurately into the film. There is a ton of stuff that has changed and a whole lot that was completely omitted, but it kept the spirit of the books while changing just enough to fit the new format. What it did bring from the books was mostly accurate and honestly, in some cases, kind of better. We'll go into what it did well as an adaptation a little more later. Right now, let's go over the major positives that this thing has going for it, just as a standalone feature. To start, the casting was pretty darn spot on. Freddie Highmore is seriously one of the best actors working today and was still incredible as a child. Not only does he do a great job playing two roles, but he makes those two roles so distinct and unique from each other so I can always tell which twin is which as soon as they start talking. This, of course, also has a lot to do with the direction and the writing, but given how great Freddy is and everything else, he deserves so much praise for what he was able to pull off here. The only thing I will say, his American accent seems somewhat forced on certain words, but he's still doing a lot better than a whole bunch of adult actors today, so honestly, I don't really care. Sarah Bolger as Mallory is also pretty good. I'll say that she isn't quite as much a slam dunk as Freddy. Her acting in some scenes, especially the hair tying scene, isn't quite there, but where where she shines is in her chemistry with Freddy. She is 100% believable as a fed up yet still protective older sister and the relationship between her and both the brothers is so real. Yes, they fight all the time, but once danger arrives, her only goal is to protect her brothers, which she kills at, literally. Mallory is also the perfect example of a strong female character done right. They do explain it more in the books, but given the ages of the siblings, she is physically more capable than her brothers in both speed and strength. So it makes perfect sense why she is the primary physical protector. I absolutely love her. She is awesome. The adults also are all pretty well cast, especially Mary Louise Parker as Helen, who I will speak on a little bit more later, but since the adults are not really the focus of the film, there's not too much to say about them. Except for one pretty big inconsistency, the actress who plays the adult Lucinda is British, while the actress who plays the child version is not. Really bizarre oversight, but, and not too distracting. Another big positive, the design of the house. Oh my goodness, does this thing have personality. This is the type of house I want to live in if I ever have enough money to do anything. Arthur's library is by far my favorite room. So much attention to detail and is exactly what I pictured from the book descriptions. And another thing I absolutely loved, this film earns its PG. I, like so many others, have seen how PG and G have very little distinction anymore, with most films getting their PG off of some mild adult humor and nothing else. Well, not here. This is 80s PG, at least when it comes to the violence. This is a gorgeous as hell film, and the only reason it's not PG-13 is the same reason why Alien vs. Predator is an R. If the blood isn't red, it doesn't count. And these filmmakers exploit the hell out of that loophole. There is green blood flying all over the place. Tell me this would not be R if those were human fingers getting severed. And in an even bigger PG loophole, the weapons they use in the final battle are bags of bright red liquid which, when thrown at a goblin's head, melts off a chunk of their face while leaving a splatter of red behind. There is 
literally no difference between this imagery and a guy getting his face half blown off. But in this case, it's just technically not blood. And in the ultimate middle finger to the MPAA rating system, the big finishing move against the goblins involves blowing up the tomato sauce all over the house, covering every surface with red splatters. Tell me this does not look like the hallway after the system purge in Cabin in the Woods. You knew what you were doing, filmmakers, and I love you for it. Okay, so those are the major positives of the film without going into its strengths as an adaptation. But that's enough positivity, let's get into the negatives, of which there's really only two. And even of those two, only one is actually that bad. The little one is sadly the two comic relief characters, Hogsqueal and Thimbletack. Now, Thimbletack isn't as bad as Hogsqueal. My only real problem with him is that there's no consistency to his rhyming. Sometimes he rhymes, sometimes he doesn't. Given that he is played by Martin Short, I'm guessing the filmmakers probably wanted more comedy from the character, which is much harder when constricted by rhyme. And that's fine by itself, but I wish they had completely cut out all the rhyming instead of having it show up occasionally. Now, Hog Squeal, on the other hand, had some pretty big changes that I'm not really a fan of. However, I can also see why the changes were necessary to the plot. In the book, Hog Squeal was a sympathetic hobgoblin who would help out the Grey siblings, but his number one goal was always his own safety. He straight up joins Mulgrath just because everyone else was doing it and he didn't want to get left behind. Yes, he doesn't actively participate in destroying the house, but he's still a part of the enemy's army and without the Grace kids, probably never would have turned on Mulgrath on his own. In the film, Hogsqueal has an established goal to kill Mulgrath because Mulgrath killed his family. From the first moment we see him, he is actively helping the Grace kids on their journey. It takes out a lot of the gray morality seen in the book with the line between good and evil being very much more cut and dry. Of course, that does kind of come with the other changes the film made and where it chose to put focus on. We'll get into where the focus went a little later, and I think it was overall worth it to lose Hogsqueal's fluctuating morality for the other stuff we got. And the big negative, which actually does impact the quality of the film, is the CGI. Absolutely none of the creatures look even the slightest bit realistic. Honestly, they would look perfectly at home in a 3D animated film. However, despite them not looking real, the designs are still pretty good. They are right from the pages of the books, and the movements, for the most part, look okay. It's really just a texture issue, which I think that that's the right words. I don't really know anything about visual effects, but I think it's the texture that's off here. The only design I don't 100% like is Mulgrath, and for once, it's not because he doesn't look like the book. I actually never found the book illustrations of him very scary. If anything, I thought they were silly looking. This design is, in my opinion, actually an improvement, but it still doesn't quite reach scary levels. By far, the scariest moments Mulgrath had throughout the film are when he first turns into his true form, but we only see part of him, and when he turns into a snake during the climax. I also have a big problem with how his final form was revealed. His first full reveal is at the beginning of the final fight when he bursts in through the floorboards, which is a fine entrance, but I think the first time we see his ogre form should have been when he transformed transforms from the dad. The moment when the knife comes out covered in green blood and the dad starts changing would have been a million times cooler if that had been the big reveal of Mulgrath's ogre form. But that's really it for major negatives, and I'll say that the bad CGI does not by any means kill the movie, it's just usually a little hard to overlook. So those are my overall thoughts on the film mostly by itself without book comparisons. Now let's talk about it in the context of it being an adaptation and why I think it's probably the best adaptation we could have Gotten. As a lover of film and hopefully future filmmaker, I have always fantasized about bringing books I love to the big screen. But as I've learned more about screenwriting and filmmaking over the course of my college career, I've really begun to see how many of the books I loved as a child wouldn't translate well to film or television without major changes. Mostly in regards to the final fights, and Spiderwick is one of those titles. The climax of the books reads very well and is exciting on the page, but when I try to visualize it as a film climax, it is quite underwhelming. Really, all Jared does is get Mograth monologuing, then stab him in the foot and push him off a balcony, and the rest of the family isn't really involved. There's quite a lot of build-up to that point, but if translated to screen, I can't imagine it being anything other than boring and underwhelming. What the film did with its climax is what I think to be a brilliant solution as the whole family gets in on the fight, including the mother. It's also not just a long, slow build-up to one big finishing move. The fight with the goblins is very fun to watch and like I said before, gory as all hell. In addition to a very well adapted climax, there were also a few things I think this film did better than the book, and not just like the climax where it adapted it in a way which suited the medium better. Like the addition of this stuff in the book would have made the books better. Number one, it has fixed some
some major plot holes. When I went back to listen to all the books, I realized that somehow I had remembered there being a protective circle in the book. And that makes a whole lot of sense because without the protective circle, there are quite a few plot holes that open up. In the book, the major catalyst for moving into the final showdown is when the goblins and Mograth finally break into the house and steal the guide. Now, here's my question. If they could do that the whole time, why the crap wouldn't they have done that right away? Lucinda says they tried torturing her for information on where the guide was, so possibly they just couldn't find it without ransacking the place, so why didn't they just ransack the house as soon as Arthur disappeared? Or in the many years the house was empty? Sure, Thimbletack said he could handle goblins, but he was never a match for Mograth, so really, Mograth could have had the book the whole time if he just showed up to the house himself. The addition of the protective circle in the film is such an easy fix to this plot hole, so easy that I magically convinced myself that it was in the book for over 10 years. The other big thing which I think the film improved on from the book is with the family relationship. The book mainly focuses on the siblings' relationships with each other while Helen has a few things going on in the background and the father really doesn't get much focus at all. I mean, technically, we never actually meet him, but even through what the kids say about him, there isn't much until the last book, and even then, it kind of feels too little too late. They mention he went to California to make movies and that he's too involved with work to visit them, but again, just not enough to build a lot of emotional weight on. In the film, there is a lot more focus on the emotional conflict within the family. Helen still doesn't have any major character growing scenes, but there are a few moments sprinkled throughout which really do a lot of heavy lifting. The first night they move into the house and the faucet explodes in her face, we see her slip past her breaking point for just a few seconds before regaining her composure. In just those few seconds, we see how overwhelming this whole situation is for her, but also how hard she will fight to put on a brave face in front of her kids. Another quick scene was when we see her at work. It's mostly played for laughs, but we do see another thing piled onto her plate with her having to learn a new job and also from her reaction to seeing the kids she's frustrated but not really surprised that they are causing trouble and then there is her acceptance of the fairy world we don't actually get to see helen find out about the fairies in the book which is understandable after you've been kidnapped and tortured by goblins i don't think you would need much convincing but in the film it was really played in a very interesting way and i kind of love it of course she does not believe them until she sees real proof in thimbletack and the goblins and that sends her into a bit of a shock then she she's got her children running around creating magical barriers and gathering weapons, which I can only imagine isn't helping the stress levels. Until finally, Jared hands her two knives and tells her she's about to be in a giant battle, to which she replies, Good thing we're New Yorkers. From that moment on, she is 100% on board with the battle and doesn't waste any energy worrying about nothing making sense. She has one mission, and that is to protect her children, and if that involves massacring little green men, by God, that is what she is going to do! I freaking love this whole scene. Yes, the New Yorker's line is kind of corny, and yes, it's a very quick turnaround from shock to acceptance, but I think that just points to how awesome of a character she is. She doesn't constantly badger Jared with questions, which would have slowed everything down. She doesn't need to understand why everything thing is happening, all she needed was visual evidence of the threat, and now she'll do whatever it takes to save her family. I'm guessing quite a lot of explaining happened after the fight, but she didn't need it in the moment because she is an absolutely awesome mom. In addition to Helen's character and her relationship with Jared, the father's connection with Jared is also done much better in this film than in the books. For starters, in the books, the divorce seems more or less amicable. As the one time we hear Helen talking to Richard in the books, there doesn't seem to be much tension between them. In the film, it's very much the opposite with immediate tension as soon as Richard calls and there is sort of an implication that he cheated given how fast he moved on with someone else. Where the film really shines brighter than the book though is with Jared coming to terms with his father's shortcomings. I am not a child of divorce so I'm not super sure of the anger that arises from those events but I know what it's like to be mad at a parent for something that is not the parent's fault. And then you think better of the other parent as a result. And this seems quite realistic to how I remember those situations. Jared sees his dad as a hero, and he is in denial about the fact that, yeah, his father kind of abandoned them. He's still in contact, but he doesn't seem like he's making much of an effort to show up, and given the cheating implications, it looks like he wants to start over with a new family. Where this improvement is best summed up is during the final fight where Mulgrath is disguised as Richard and is trying to trick Jared into giving him the field guide. In the books, like I said, Jared's whole relationship with his father was very glanced over and didn't get a lot of focus until the final book. Because of this, it's harder to understand why Jared 
Jared is so suspicious of his dad when they find him. And when he tells Jared, I want us all to be a family again, and Jared takes that as the sign that he's Mulgraf, it doesn't hit as emotionally hard as I think it should. That is even more true when compared to how emotionally hard the same scene hits in the film. As established, there has been a lot more focus on Jared's relationship with his father, and we actually saw him face the hard truth when he realizes his dad isn't the hero he thought. This creates much bigger emotional stakes for the scene, and then the tip-off line being changed from, I want us to all be a family again, to, I just wanted to tell you that I love you makes the emotions so much more devastating. Jared 100% believed his father no longer loved him, or at least believed that he would not say I love you. Like he was so sure his dad wouldn't say it that he was totally fine stabbing him in the chest. Man, that is heavy. Of course, we do get a little bit of reassurance from Helen that Jared is wrong and his father still loves him, but still heavy. And those are my thoughts on the film as an adaptation. Like I said at the beginning, probably the best adaptation we could have gotten. The reason I think this film is as perfect an adaptation as possible, given the medium transfer, is that it elevates what it adapts. The books are an epic fantasy adventure with storylines of emotion and family conflict. The film has a decent fantasy adventure, but there is a lot more focus on the family relationship and emotional turmoil. In a 90-minute movie, that is where the focus should be. There isn't time to visit the elves, the dwarves, go to school, raise a griffin, or all the other plot points in the books. Yes, those stories in the books were amazing, to read, and despite the trailer not looking very promising, I hope to see book four represented in the new TV series, but in a film format, all those detours would make the story feel very rushed and muddled. Focusing in on the character relationships, keeping only the side characters which are necessary, and emphasizing the emotional turmoil of the family is why this film succeeds so well as an adaptation. Honestly, the two together act as great companion pieces. For more of the epic world building, read the books, and for more of the emotional storytelling, watch the film. Together, they sync perfectly, and I wish we saw more adaptations which worked like that. And yes, I did casually mention that Hollywood has completed another adaptation, this time as a streaming series which was supposed to be on Disney+, Plus, but was sold to Roku. Hopefully not because it was terrible, but just by judging from the trailer, yeah, it kind of looks that way. Of course, trailers for terrible things can be awesome and trailers for awesome things can be terrible, but they do seem to be making some changes which change the entire nature of the story. And yes, I did just rant for X amount of minutes about an adaptation needing to make changes to fit the new format, but some of the changes this show looks like it's made, like I said, they look like they completely changed the nature of the story. I'm planning on making a video about the show once it's released, so I'll go a little more into those changes I notice in that video, but to bullet point quickly, Mograth looks like he'll be on screen in human form throughout most of the show, which takes away a lot of the fear and the mystery of his character. The entire mission the kids need to go on is completely different. And the most obvious one, these kids. They are way too old. I know it's easier to work with adults, but there's a lot of difference between a 9 or 10 year old discovering fairies and a 15 year old doing the same thing. One's gonna accept it way easier than the other, and this just completely changes that whole thing. Also, even though the trailer makes it look like Mallory's still gonna be the badass protector or something, the twins look bigger and stronger than her. So it won't make sense anymore why she's the protector, except for the fact that she knows how to wield a sword, but still, they're bigger, stronger, and faster so it still doesn't make a ton of sense. I am really hoping that this is just a bad trailer and that they somehow make the ages of the kids work, but yeah, I'm not exactly holding my breath. So that's about it for this episode of Childhood Rewind. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time with something else. Probably the new Spiderwick show. See y'all later.